Hi guys, welcome to the 2020 edition of the D2 Talks. This week on the channel we have Normly, founder and principal of Normly, a creative agency based in Toronto, Canada. This is a company that has 20 years experience. Norm himself shared a lot of his insights with me in this chat and I'm pretty sure that you're going to enjoy it. Make sure you subscribe if this is the first time that you check out our videos. Hit the like button if you like them and share them with your friends and colleagues to get the conversation going. Norm, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I apologize for the background noise. I'm in a convention center right now. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me properly, yeah? Yes, I can hear you very well and thanks a lot for taking the time for doing this because I know you have a very busy schedule, but I really wanted to have you on the channel. I'm a very big fan of your work, especially for the fact that you managed to build a company and to come out almost of nowhere. And you know, like now you I have this. Call, it's, it's, it's been almost 20 years. That's no, that's not exactly nowhere. It no, means but, I kind of you know, like, along the way. No, no, but the thing is that, like, nobody knew about you, about your work, because I was having a conversation about your, uh, your, your company, and, you know, all of a sudden you started to put out all this work, and people were like, who's this guy? We never seen him, we never talked to him. I know, it's, it's a funny story, so I, I'm, uh, I'm at this event, and this woman, she introduced herself, I'm like, oh, I'm Norm Lee, she's like, oh, you're Norm Lee. She goes, you are the most prolific freelancer I've ever come across. Freelancer. All right. I was like, um, there's 40 of us. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. you know, on that note, tell me how you got started. Um, true story. I was uh, in school and uh, I had fucked around a little bit with, like, you know, Photoshop and a little bit with, like, Form Z. So this was, like, you know, late 90s. And uh, so I get this interview for a co op job and they say, do you know how to use Max? I'm like, of course I know how to use Macs. They're in the computer lab. I use them all the time. <laughs> and I got to the first day and like, I was like, where's all the Macs? <laughs> and uh, we realized that I had no idea what the fuck I was doing, but they had hired me, so we were stuck with each other. And uh, so uh, Nick Mashenko from Design Store was working there at the time. And so he taught me a lot. And, and uh, on day one, basically, I had to go out. I don't know if you, how old are you? I'm 37. Okay, so you don't know this. So back then there used to be a book called the Wiley 3DS Max Bible. Okay, never and heard of it. it exactly. There's a book called the Wiley 3DS Max Bible and basically over the course of two weeks I had to teach myself how to render, basically. And, that, and the rest is history. I guess it worked out, right? <laughs> it worked out a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, like, Sometimes it still sounds weird when people say to me, yeah, I had this book where I learned 3D. I'm like, oh, I know. how do you learn 3D from a book? All you young guys have so many fucking tutorials out there. <laughs> learn vray.com this. Tell me how to do shit dot, dot net. Like, you know, like you guys like, I, I mean, I got to tell you. Well, I mean, that's the gift and the curse, right? So like for guys like me, you know, we had an advantage in that, like, you know, if you really studied the books and if you really had an interest, there weren't that many of us out there. You know, at the time when I when I joined that studio, we were one of two in, in Canada. Maybe three, you know? And uh, so there wasn't much competition. And I think that's that was one of the advantages I had, was that when I was coming up, you know, uh, D-Box had just started, I think. Um, Hayes Davidson was around. That was about it. Like, there wasn't a lot of competition. Have you ever met Jeff Mottle? No, never met Jeff Mottle. Because that's the thing, you know, like, I was talking to him. He's from Canada. I mean, he's a legend in this field. And, you know, we were discussing your work, and he was like, I don't know, they must be really young. And I was like, listen, I'm I went to... I went, I went on the website and these guys, they've been around for, uh, for a while and, yeah. but anyway. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, I mean, I think, you know, the thing about, you know, the work now is that, you know, I think the, the difference is that, you know, th there's a lot of studios that get a lot of attention um, because of their work. But where we came from, it wasn't about getting attention. In fact, we were oftentimes 
Uh, the reason why a lot of people don't know about us is because you know the industry is very focused on real estate marketing now, which gets a lot of publicity, which get, which gets a lot of attention. You know, when I was coming up, condos weren't a thing. You know, luxury hotels weren't a thing, and you know the bulk of our work was like you know subway systems and like universities and colleges and art galleries and 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 quite frankly the work wasn't that good back then just because of the tools right so people would look at the stuff and you know they consider it decent but it wasn't like anything show-stopping and so we just we we were always in the trenches you know so we so we spent a long time that's really interesting but so you are uh, trained as an architect yeah so i i went to uh university of waterloo uh, quickly decided I was never going to become an architect because, you know, that's a shitty life. And, uh, Says four, the 3D four months, artist. <laughs> I know, four, four months shy of my degree, I decided it wasn't for me. <laughs> my parents had a complete and utter fucking shit. But they still loaned me the $10,000 to buy my first, first workstation. And uh, I, I um, well, so the, actually, the story is, I actually first got an offer to leave and uh, join a studio. And this will shock, shock the artists out there now. My starting salary back then was twenty-eight thousand Canadian dollars. Oh my God! And I think with the exchange rate at the time, you know, for for your American listeners or, or viewers, you know, that would translate to roughly like less than twenty thousand dollars a year. Oh my God! That was my salary. Yeah, you know, like, and so I, I I chose that path, and then you know some shit happened, and uh, I started my own gig, and uh, never looked back. Okay, that, that's a very good segue for me because I would like to hear a little bit your entrepreneurial story. You know, a lot of people get influenced and inspired by others that have done already something good with, uh, with, their, uh, with their career. I like to hear your story. How did that happen? What were the problems, the challenges that you had to face? Well, I don't think you have a podcast long enough to cover 18 years worth of bullshit. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, so when I first started, um, it was just me and I worked seven days a week, 20 hours a day. And, uh, you know, there's, there was a lot of learning. Like I, I was making a lot of money, but like, you know, as the story goes on, you'll see why it was a terrible fucking thing. So I started, I worked out of my own basement for like five years. And back then, like, I mean, it wasn't about quality. It wasn't about, um, it wasn't about, uh, size of projects because you know people didn't think of 3d as like a major tool so i get all these little projects people want them fast and want them quick and i i just did them and so i worked for about five years doing that and i was also i also had a couple side hustles at the time right like so all these young people that think like side hustles a new thing no i mean we all had side hustles back then too right so like i was like rendering 20 hours a day for seven days a week and i was djing you know three nights a week too right so i was basically up 24 7. And so I couldn't keep up the lifestyle, so I decided to hire someone. And then it just sort of grew from there because, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I think the one thing that people um, make a mistake about is that they always think of our industry as a field of artists. You know, they think about the artistry. They think about, you know, they think of us almost as a tech field. Right? They think about, oh, I'm going to have this innovation in lighting, or I'm going to do this about animation, and that's going to make my, make my career. It's not. You know, fundamentally, what we are is a service industry. And that was one of my blessings in life, right? So between just building the business, and, and quite actually, like, my time as DJ actually helped me a lot, because, you know, what people always came to me for was my ability to maintain relationships and read between the lines. I think that was the most important thing was that, you know, the, the basis of our business has been on relationships and it's always been being able to deliver the things to people that they, in their heads, know they want but weren't able to express. And that's how we really built a reputation and, um, and uh, uh, an audience for our work. So it wasn't like, you know, these days, you know, you'll get a set of drawings and you pump out renderings. Yes, there's collaboration along the way. In my day, even though I was an outside consultant, I had a computer that was built in a rack mount case, but a single unit rack mount case. And I would take this to various architecture firms and 
design shops. I would say, you provide me with two monitors, a keyboard, and a mouse. And we're not talking flat screens here, right? We're talking like CRTs. We're talking like CRTs with like two-inch fucking bezels on them. ViewSonics. Does anyone remember ViewSonics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like your desk had to be four feet deep to accommodate. A, oh, by the way, you're fucking like 27 or 30 inch monitors. You know, my biggest monitor back then, like I had to save up to buy a 16 inch CRT. You know, like, so anyway, so I would make them provide me two monitors and I would sit there with the principals of some of the most prominent Canadian architecture firms and sit in the office with them all day long and just sort of back and forth designing buildings together, quite frankly. Now, credit where credit is due, they did the bulk of the designing, but the beauty was, you know, I got to exercise my architectural background and, you know, give my input and like, you know, I'd be like, I'd be like rendering something, I'd turn to the guy and be like, it's bullshit, stop that, like that's fugly. And then, you know, I was smart enough though to be like, it's fugly because, and, you know, I would give my rationale. And that's how we became very um, embedded with a lot of architecture firms in Canada and Toronto specifically. There is a thing that you said a few minutes ago about building relationships uh, and being able to read through the lines. I think that one of the biggest mistakes that people do when they think about building relationships is to just focus on these, you know, staying in touch or being in contact with people. And they tend not to use their empathy once they do have that connection. The ability of like holding a relationship and being able to read through the lines, I think that these are very strictly connected, right? You, you cannot yeah. have one without the other. Yeah. Well, you know, like, it's a constant um, topic of debate, right? And especially in the industry and even in our studio. You know, like this idea of um, scope and change orders and extras. And I'm, I'm all for that, right? Like, you know, I watch you and Chris Doe and, and uh, you know, a bunch of other people. And, you know, we all, always talk about getting what you're worth. I think that has to be oftentimes, you know, I got to say this especially with the sort of fractured nature of our industry, right? Like if you think about it, how many big firms are there? There's not that many big firms. So most people aren't in the mindset of um, making a business work. Like my job is not to render. I haven't rendered anything probably like almost 10 years now. My job is to keep the lights on, keep people fed, keep people clothed, keep people in houses, right? And so. I have to maintain those relationships and make sure our clients keep coming back. And so th there has to be a balance between, yes, getting you know what you're worth, but also helping your clients get to their goals. And it's a tricky balance, right? Because sometimes you know, you're just gonna be like bending over backwards and taking it, and you know, you gotta make a calculated risk to decide whether or not that's gonna pay off in the long run. And so that's where you actually, so the idea of relationships, it's an interesting one, right? Because you know, a lot of people out there, you know, their goal is to basically dominate the market. They want to just hoover up everything in sight. It's not going to happen. You're not right for everyone. That's, that's, the, that's the secret sauce to relationships is that you belong to a certain tribe. That's the bottom line. You're born into that tribe, whether you, let, whether you know it or not. And the people that you're going to work best with are the people that are in the same tribe. So, you know, you know, I, I've, I, I have this story multiple times through my career. You know, we see a really great design firm that we want to work with. We blow our brains out to get in with them. You start working with them, it's a gong show. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're like, okay, well, it's a comic show, but we really want to work with them. They're really prominent. You know, they're famous. You know, like, it'll help our portfolio, blah, blah, blah. But the question is, at what point do you call it quits? You know, in our firm, you know, we understand that we could be fired, but I also strongly believe in firing clients. You know, we fire clients probably on an average of two to three a year. 
because at some point you realize like they're just not right for you. And it's not that they're bad people. Their communication style is different. Their personalities don't don't mesh with yours, and it's just painful for everyone. So if you truly respect the person, you can have a nice way of saying to them, "Hey, love ya, but fuck off." <laughs> I have the feeling, like listening to you, that we probably consume the, the same type of content. We might also read the same type of books because, you know, you mentioned... Well, we're probably part of the same tribe. <laughs> the the Look, tribe, see, you know. <laughs> I wear a hat, you wear a hat. Uh, if I could get my headphones working, I'd be wearing headphones right now. Yeah, you know. The only thing I can't do is grow facial hair. <laughs> Norm, let me ask you... Uh, something about working rituals. When you yeah. start working on something, on a task, is there some sort of preparation that you do? And I'll give you an example. Myself, I keep all the tasks on an Evernote file. If there are things that are imminent, I write them on a little booklet where I like to, you know, write by hand and tick them off. Um, I'm trying to get to the way you manage to be productive. Can you share some insights? Yeah, for sure. Um, being productive uh, means several things. Uh, number one, uh, I write. So everything I do, I write. Because the thing is, is like, you know, my, my greatest skill and my greatest um, weakness is that I'm very spontaneous. You know? I, I just shoot my mouth off all the time. You know, clients love and hate that about me. But if you're really doing something of note, something important, and those things come up on a daily basis for us. You know, I'm a big Evernote fan, just like yourself. Um, I write. You know, whatever I'm thinking, I write. So I used to communicate through email, and I quickly realized that, you know, no one reads my fucking emails because they're like six pages long. <laughs> but what was, but I, the reason why I liked writing these emails was because it allowed me to write my thoughts out, review my thoughts, and it also allowed me to give my thoughts to other people and have them challenge my thoughts. Because there's two things I do. The first thing I do is I write, but the second thing I do, so you know, everyday shit, whatever. But when it comes to important stuff, I think it's really important that you, know, you, you stay sort of intellectually humble and understand that your perspective is not necessarily the correct perspective. So I always, you know, either with my team or with um, a trusted colleague in the, in, in the industry or a trusted client, I'll ask them to review my thoughts and challenge me. So I'm not looking for someone that agrees with me, right? I, I purposely go and find someone that I know is gonna have the opposite opinion. And that, and that helps me refine my thoughts before I then go and deploy. I think that uh, somebody refers to this as professional disagreement um, so it's also um, there's a great um, sort of uh, this guy's at uh, he's a consultant but I think he's at Harvard um, and it's funny because he consults a lot for Boeing so I think Boeing wasn't really listening to his uh, <laughs> his advice because <laughs> they're kind of fucked right now um, it's called conversational capacity Right? So you have a hypothesis, right? So you, you create your hypothesis, and then you invite someone to challenge it, and then you go back again, right? And, and you, you refine it, and then you go and try to poke holes in it, right? So because, like, no, no thought that you come out with right from the gate is perfect. All thoughts that you have, no matter how well intentioned they are, will always have unintended consequences. So, for important stuff, like you gotta refine and refine and refine. Norm, to date, what is one of the things that you know you wish that you had known when starting out? <laughs> so many, so many. Uh, but uh, I thought about this. So when you invited me to to be beyond this, you know, I, I've, I've. I've seen you address it. I've seen guys like Christo address it. Um, I don't see it addressed a lot openly in the industry. And it's this. When people say know your worth, 
it's a really important idea to get a hold of. The majority of the operations out there are like freelancers, two, three man operations, maybe up to 10. Okay. And they're trying to get in, right? Like they're trying to make a name for themselves. So they're going to undercut. By undercutting, you're not only just fucking the industry, you're fucking your future self. And I know this from experience. And I, I'm really transparent, so I, I'm going to talk numbers here. So when we, when, not when we, when I first started, you know, I heard in the industry that the average back 20 years ago was that people were charging $5,000 for an image. Boggled my mind. I was like, how the fuck are people charging $5,000 for an image? Like, where the fuck does the money go? I'm in my basement with two, uh, two ViewSonics and a $10,000 machine. Fuck, I could pay for all that shit in three renderings. Ah, you know what? I think I can charge $1,500 bucks and get by. $1,500 bucks a render. I'm doing like five renderings a week. I'm happy as a pig and shit. I'm making like $250,000, $300,000 a year. That right? What people need to understand is that if you are actually planning to grow this into a business, there are additional costs that come down the road. Just because you have low overhead in the moment, good for you. But don't undercut and underprice to get the market share, and I'll tell you why. So that was 20 years ago, okay? Like 18 years ago, 1500 bucks a piece. It probably took me another 12 to 15 years to get up to $3,000 a piece because I had set the bar at $1,500, right? So you just do the compounding, right? So if you increase 5 to 10% a year, how far can you get? Yeah. It takes a long time to get up to $3,000. And it, it's really funny because it took me, you know, 15 years to get up to like $3,000. And then over the last couple of years, like we had, a, we had, we almost lost it all like three times in the last few years because we weren't charging proper prices. The crazy thing, in the last 18 months, we've raised our prices 50% year over year. So we went from 3,000 to 4,500. No one blinked a fucking eye. So why the fuck did I spend 15 years going from 1,500 to 3,000? And the other thing that was great about it was the clients that we really had a great time working with that valued our work, they had no problem paying it because they, they understood the value was there. We just never asked for it. They were willing to pay that all along. So we can't go back in time and ask them for that money now. Right? So all the bullshit that I went through because I didn't have the right financial structures in place, that was all my doing. It wasn't because the, it wasn't because the market wasn't willing to pay it because I wasn't willing to ask for it, because I wasn't valuing myself the way I should have been. You see, I think, honestly, like, um, videos like the ones that we put out at the D2 or the videos that I make myself on my own channel, they should have, you know, this is the, the, the main thing that I regret not doing earlier, because already in 2013, 2014, we were getting an idea of what the prices for this industry had to be and I still know people that are charging very low because when they started out they set their bar at 200 300 a piece you know in Europe which is like it's it's crazy to even think about and a lot of artists are actually victims of their own politics right because they say this is what we have done and, and, you know, and sometimes you even fight with these people because since they haven't seen it with their own eyes, they don't believe that there is actually the possibility of, like, charging that much money. Yeah. Can I give you a statistic? So there's actually a calculator that you can get for your, for your, for your phone, okay? That actually calculates the likelihood of... How, what percentage of clients you would lose based on the increase in price. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you increase prices 
in all likelihood, you'll probably lose about 30% of your clientele. Okay? But think about that for a second. You're raising your prices 50%, but you're losing 30% of your clientele. So you're making more money and you're doing less work. Yeah. But that's not where it ends. Think about the industry we're in. What are the ingredients for a rendering? Time and money. Right? So if you have more time, the only thing that can possibly happen, unless you're going out to fuck the dog, is that you are, your, your product's going to get better. And what happens when your product gets better? You can raise your prices even more because you have more value. Yeah. Then you can buy better hardware, you can hire a strong team around you, and we can all, as artists, thrive. Because you're not doing it just for yourself, you're doing it for the industry. This is so true, you know. Um, sometimes I really, I would like for, especially, you know, the freelancers to listen to this kind of stuff with a lot more attention. Because, you know, a freelancer, by undercutting themselves, they are they are the ones that actually get burned out because you know they have to run after the client Understood. they have to wear a hundred hats you know like send the bill do the rendering go and do the photography and talk to this person talk to that person when actually if they were able to understand that you know prices need to be set in such a way that you get the economic tools for you to grow over time you might actually work a fifth of your time and still make the same amount of money. 100%. Think about this. Either you have to go find $5,000 clients, so five $1,000 clients, or you have to go find one $5,000 client. Yeah. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's not that hard. Yeah. It's not that simple. And let me tell you something else. This is the other thing that people get fucked up around. Okay? Think about this as a business, because this happened to us. And, and I've been open this about, about this with my, my Autodesk reseller, right? <laughs> so we grew from a studio of one to 42, okay? That was our peak. We were 42. We had four fucking licenses of Autodesk. But we were a 42-man shop. We couldn't hide under the radar anymore. Yeah. So one day... Shout out to Solid Cat because they're my best fucking friends. They, they hook me up all the time. So if you're in Canada and you need you need Autodesk or V-Ray or or any kind of software, call Michael Rotolo, call Dan Coogan. Great guys to deal with. They'll hook you up with the best shit at the best prices. <laughs> but so they come to my office. They go, so we we're just wondering if you had any needs. And they walk into this office, this fucking 7,000 square foot office with like 42 people in it. And these are like the biggest resellers for fucking Autodesk in the country. So they have the fucking list. They know who's got how many licenses. On that day, I went from zero expenses for Autodesk because I had four perpetual licenses, okay? To $160,000 in expenses over three years. My business model completely broke down. Yeah. Oh, and that was at the same time that I moved from an office that cost me $2,000 a month where we were jamming 22 people in, but we knew it was ridiculous because it was 2,200 square feet and we, we had 22 people in there, yeah. okay? 100 square feet per person. It's not even big enough for a desk per person. Yeah. To a $20,000 a month office. So in one year, when my prices were like, you know, twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars a piece. I incurred like an extra three hundred thousand dollars in expenses. I was fucked. I was fucked. Oh, and oh, by the way, we had just gone from twenty two to forty two in six months. So I'd more than doubled my payroll. Oh, I was fucked. And the. I wouldn't have been fucked, though, if I was charging enough money from the get-go. Right? Like, if I had the smarts to understand what it actually costs to run a business, I would have been smart enough to actually charge that much from the get-go and just stuff the fucking hundos in my jeans while my costs were still low. Like, 
that's the bottom line. You know, like the next question would have been, what is something that you have failed at that turned out to be a great life lesson? But I feel like we've been already <laughs> covering oh, no, that. Failure is, um, failure is the road to success. You know, um, I saw a great meme the other day. It's like, you know, success and failure on the same road. Success is just a little further down. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will say this. I've been through a lot of bullshit. I've been through a lot of pain. Um, despite my Asian genes, which allow my hair to stay jet black at the age of 42, <laughs> my head should be completely white, right? But I wouldn't give it up for anything. I think that it's, um, you know, the lessons that I've gone through in life, I, I now have the experience that, you know, we, we recently just started Cavia, which is uh, a Canadian uh, architectural visual, visualization industry association. I'm now using that platform to pass along these stories to other people in the industry. You know, that's why I agreed to do this interview because, you know, I figured there'd be an opportunity to share these kinds of insights and stories so that other people could say, like, look, here's a guy that's made it. Here's all the things he did wrong along the way. And here's how we can learn from that and do our and, and go along our career differently so that we could um, be successful without going through the pain. And that's why I appreciate guys like you, right? Because, you know, you know, the power of the internet and the power of sharing our stories and, you know, things like D2 and things like Total Chaos and things like, you know, SOA, shout out to, to Roberto and the crew out there because, you know, th th I think that was the really first... Um, uh, ma major community hub for our industry that people really gravitated towards, you know. And then roughly around the same time, we discovered you guys. So I sent I sent Chris from my office to, to your your conference. He loved it. Um, and uh, but you guys are in Europe are really lucky that way. You guys have a lot of that kind of stuff. And let's be realistic here. I mean, Europe is the size of my province in Canada, <laughs> and flights between like you know Venice and and uh, and uh, Paris and whatever it's a short flight even Tel Aviv I mean you guys are fucking hop skip and jump away <laughs> you know so you guys are lucky so we're trying to start a little bit of that on, on our side of the pond too it would be it would be very interesting to see if you guys do it what what the turnout would be well it's not been bad right so we sort of just sort of you know I called all the studios in Toronto it's really funny so I was going through a really shit time last year and, you know, the clients were just like, you know, really completely just hammering me, right? I was like, I know this is not just me, right? But, like, I have to fight this on my own. And I know that our clients are basically playing all the studios off one another. So they'll come to me, and if they don't get the terms they like for me, they'll go somewhere else. And if they don't get the terms there, they'll go and go and go. Because, you know, Toronto's got a very vibrant uh, archivist scene. And so I called up all the other studios, right? And, you know, you know how it is kind of frenemies right like you know each other you know each other five face but if you see each other in a room you kind of turn your head and look the other way and pretend you're not there <laughs> <laughs> so i called everyone i'm like okay guys enough of this bullshit the only people that are benefiting despite the fact that i do love them and i respect them is our clients because as an industry um we're not doing the things we need to do to make sure that we have futures you know, like, it was kind of a race to the bottom situation. So we got together and, uh, you know, sort of started doing that. And uh, the first event, we had uh, 150 registrants, and, and we had a, a, over 100 people show up. That's very cool. And we've had another event, and we had two more events, and each event has drawn about 100-plus people. So it's good. So it's good. It's incredible. So we're hoping to build that community in North America. Like, we know there's ASAI. Um, but that seems to be more American focused, and uh, we, we were just looking for something Canadian centric. That's really cool. That's really cool. It takes a lot of time, but you know, if we can be of any help, just let us know. Yeah, you know, like I was talking to the guys about. So we're 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 planning to have an award show for the end of the year because you know, that, I think that's the one thing is that like, you know, there's a lot of award shows in Europe. So it's easy for the Europeans to fly over. And I know Jose from Toronto goes, you know, Jose came to um, uh, D2 and he was there and, you know, he picked up some hardware, I think. But um, it's, it's difficult for our community to travel to Europe. 
you know, and to create something locally. Um, so, but I was saying, you know, it'd be great to have a keynote speaker. Hey, buddy, I think you're a pretty good speaker. I, I like your vibe, right? So, you know, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe we'll have you come over. You like Vancouver? I've never been. All right. Well, I think we're gonna have to have you over to Vancouver. <laughs> All right. Let's set it up. Let's set this up. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Norm, let me ask you. We have already touched a little bit on this. No is a powerful word. It's I call it the super tool of designers. It can empower people and you know it can open a world of possibilities. Do you use it? I guess you do. And how? What's what's how do you like using it? Put it this way. So no is a powerful word. I think people don't use the word no enough. Um, you know, you have to understand that um, when you say yes to everything, you're actually saying no to yourself and you're saying no to progress. Because if you, you know, we still have this problem today, right? Like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Our studio has so much fucking work. We barely get to do any R&D, if at all. Mm. Right? So you think about this, right? R&D is very important. So by saying yes to everything, you're denying yourself just that. You're denying yourself the ability to improve yourself. But, but you know, like I said in the beginning, I'm a relationships guy, right? So you know, I'm reading this book right now, uh, Excellence Wins by Horst Schultz, right? The founder of the uh, Ritz Carlton. And, and I've always had, held the same view is that, you know, I don't care what business you're in. I don't care if you're selling cars, if you're selling hamburgers, if you're selling fucking renderings. I don't care if you're fucking Apple. At the end of the day, it's still relationship driven, right? People have a relationship to you and your brand. So what clients like to hear the least is no. They don't want to hear no. In fact, it's almost deadly to say no, right? Because you say no, they're going to go somewhere else and they might strike up a relationship there and they'll just move on. They'll just never call you again. So having said that, I still believe in saying no. But what I do is I, I twist that. I say, no, but. So we say, no, we can't fulfill your original request, but here's what we can do to help you get to your goal. It may require some negotiation in terms of timeline, may require some negotiation in terms of price or process, but here's what we can do. So no, we can't do your original request, but here's what we can do to help you get to your goal. I think that is um, something that people, you know, because, you know, the people that are in the no camp, like, they're, they're a hard no, right? It's like, no, not doing it. And they just walk away, right? Like, it's like, no, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where we're like, no, no, right? And there's a difference. And I think that's another sort of hallmark <clears throat> of our business is that we're very solutions driven. We're very solutions based is that we understand that our clients aren't uh, coming to us with last minute requests because they're assholes, because they're dicks, because they're, they're, they're trying to you know get one over on us. Um, it's because they're under similar pressure. And you know the same way that you know uh, artists, uh, we form an industry and we should be aligned together, you know, uh, with our clients, we're part of the real estate industry. And there's, there's an element of collegiality that has to be established there as well. Yeah. You just mentioned a book that you were reading. Um, I'm interested to know a little bit about some books that have influenced you in the way you do things and that we could recommend to other creatives that are trying to emulate the success that you've had, that you've had in your life. Well, I think um, one of the best books is uh, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. Um, that's the story of Pixar from uh, the, the perspective of, you know, someone who built Pixar, really. Um, another formative book for me is uh, Simon Sinek. I'm, I'm right here. Yeah, uh, Simon Sinek, it starts with why, right? So you get, yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of people start, yeah, exactly. It's a great book. It's a very good book. But you know, but you know what's really funny? You pick up that book, it's a fucking roadmap on how to run a creative business. Yeah. You know, like things like brain trust, right? Things like creative reviews, things like, you know, just fucking off and doing something, 
right? Even if it doesn't make money, right? Like, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what field you're in, you can take all of that and relate it back to what you do. So I think that was a great book. Um, so that book uh, starts with why, Simon Sinek. That's a big one because, you know, in what we do as artists, we're communicators. And so, you know, oftentimes I think that um, there's such a focus on the what, which is the building or the space. Uh, one of the things that we've always been told that differentiates our product, at least in the local market, is the storytelling in our imagery. Um, the entourage, the sort of placement of people, like, you know, like, you know, if you're working in in Sweden versus, you know, LA, you know, the people should be different, right? The trees should be different. The fucking clouds even should be different, you know? So that, that idea of it starts with why, you know, you really have to get into the mindset of why something's being uh, created. Like, you know, why are you rendering this building? Is it to raise funds for um, a university or is it to sell a condo, right? Two very different stories. Um, uh, change the culture, change the game. Um, tells a lot of stories about um, uh, different businesses and, and how they've made it. Um, for the podcast people, uh, How I Built This with Guy Raz. You ever listen to that? No. Check it out. How I Built This with Guy Raz. It's an NPR podcast. It's my second favorite podcast. Um, I'm making notes. The speaker first. <laughs> I'll send you notes. Okay. Um, uh, what else? Oh, power of a positive no. You know, my whole no but thing, that comes from that book, you know, power of a positive no. William Urey, so William Urey, uh, U-R-Y. Um, big fan of uh, Harvard Business Review. Lots of sort of short reads, 10 pages long, really actionable stuff. Yeah. I think this is gold. I think that we're giving already a lot to our listeners to have to go through. Well, fundamentally, what I hope people get out of this interview is that, yes, we are artists, but we are also business people. You know, I have this, I have this perspective on life. Every single person is self-employed, myself included. Even if you're employed by a big corporate giant, you're self-employed. Because ultimately you have a client. Your client is your boss. Your boss has the power to hire and fire you. Right? Everyone up the and your boss has a client. Right? The VP is his boss. The VP has a boss. That's the CEO. Right? We all have clients in life. And so, you know, all these people that sit there and like, oh, I'm not making any progress, or like, you know, my company doesn't pay attention to me. Yeah, I mean that happens. And it's it's not necessarily um, uh, nefarious or vindictive. It's not like, you know, like, you know, like we're going through a process right now where, you know, we're trying to realign salaries and we're trying to, you know, figure out, you know, um, uh, team retention and all that kind of stuff, right? We've got 40 people. Like it's, we should be working on that shit. It's not like we never thought about it. It's just that we didn't have time to deal with that shit. But I would say to, and I, I would openly say this to my team is that, you know, like, hey, I'm the kind of guy, if shit's fucked up, tell me. Because sometimes I just don't know, right? And so it's always up to people to, you know, advocate for themselves, right? And so that's why I want people to get out of this is that we're all in business for ourselves. And you have to look out for yourself. And not because you're selfish, but because you looking out for yourself will help. If you're part of a team, it will help your team. Like, you know, if you come to me with a problem, you're not allowed to come to me with just the problem. You have to come to me with your solution. Great. Yeah. And the other thing that we also say to our team is that, you know, like, look, I know it can be scary for them to come up with solutions. Because if they come up with a solution, what if it's the wrong solution and the client loses their share? Mm. And so what I tell my team all the time is that there's not much I can't fix with a phone call or a dinner. You know? Like, really. I mean, like, Everyone fucks up, right? And, you know, it's the job of guys like me to go firefight, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I've my team's fucked up. I fucked up multiple times. But people are 
generally pretty reasonable. They understand that shit gets fucked up. It's how you deal with the fuck up that matters, right? So number one, being solutions-based, so knowing that you fucked up and not just going, oh, I fucked up, and then waiting for your client to fix it, right? You say like, oops, I fucked up, here's how we're gonna fix it. And then following that up by going to your client saying like, hey, you know, we know we fucked up, here's what we observed from that, here's what we learned from that, and here's how we're gonna do things differently going forward to make sure that doesn't happen again, or, if it, or, or that if it does happen, we can catch it quickly and prevent it from, you know, reaching the same sort of catastrophic result. That's very valuable. Um, Norm, let me ask you, what is one of the, or what are some of the bad recommendations that you heard in your profession and that you think that people should not follow? Well, number one, don't pirate software. <laughs> pirating software all, you know, because pirating software and uh, p pirating software gives you this, you know, unnatural um, belief that you have low overhead, right? Because I gotta say, I mean, Autodesk, outside of labor, I think Autodesk is my single biggest, well, la rent. Outside of labor and rent, Autodesk is my single biggest expense, right? So there's that. I think the other thing is, um, you know, um, people often, it's not so much advice that I've been given, but, you know, people often um, in this day and age feel like, you know, they should be different and be bold and like strike out, like just to be different. The, 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 the progress that I made when I was trying to be unique and be different singularly, right? Just the single minded obsession with doing things different. I got nowhere. You know, um, who was it that you were talking to? Um, Ian Spriggs, right? So when Ian Spriggs does a portrait, it's not like he sits there and fucking conjures a fucking portrait from his fucking imagination, right? He looks at Rembrandt, he looks at, you know, a, a reference. It's okay to, you know, look at a reference. You don't have to be completely original when you start. And I think, especially with the resources that you have today, I mean, you'd be stupid to, um, to do that. I think, you know, there's such a focus on being a snowflake these days, right? Like, you know, like millennials and this whole snowflake thing and like, you know, being unique and being special. You don't have to be special. You have to be good. And there's a difference. Um, but I mean, you know, I, I was lucky enough that I got a lot of great advice coming up along the way. Um, you know, and uh, I've, I've got a lot of great people in my life that great give good advice. So... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of bad advice out there. But maybe that's the thing, right? You know, like, take all the advice you're given and decide if it's for you. I think that's the thing, is that, you know, all, almost all advice is to some degree good because it's worked for the people that are giving it to you, but it's not necessarily going to work for you. Right? So... People should develop that ability to filter information. And it's like, yeah. you know, maybe like um, one of the things that I always say to those who come to me and uh, ask for my advice is, you know, try to, what I say might be wrong. So, you know, try to use your ability to connect things that I might say that might work for you with other things that you know that are already working for you with the advice that some other people are giving you. You know, it's like, don't be monothematic, monodirectional, you know, be flexible, yeah. use your own ability. You have to use your own ability and you have to be, um, uh, you're right, you have to be flexible and, and every concept, every idea that you're trying to apply, you have to understand that you can't apply it in the exact same way for every single person out there that's your client base, right? Like, so you have to adapt constantly. and. Just be ready to adapt and be ready to, to switch it up. Let me ask you, do you think that the community in our industry supports the industry itself? Or do you think that there are areas where we should or we could and we should do better? Uh, I think the industry does not support itself. 
I think if you look at the state of our industry, um, think about this. Without our visualizations, without our animations, without our interactive pieces, developers, architects, builders, they have to take all, right? Because step one in any building process is city approvals and financing. In order to do both, you need visuals. And uh, so we play an important role in the process. But then we're out here basically all undercutting each other. People still aren't doing it. Yeah. Because they think that you might be lying, you know, to sabotage them. What, what motive do I have to do that? I don't know. I have more work than I can, to, can take in. I'm turning away work. And this is the paradox, like people don't believe that, you know, you'll tell them I have a lot of like, you know, the, the big names out there that they come to me and say, we don't have enough personnel to work with and we are turning down work. And on the other hand, I have a lot of freelancers that say there is no work out there. And I'm like, no, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. The reason why freelancers or smaller outfits get turned down for a lot of stuff is not price. What people are buying is not a rendering. What people are buying is a process, it's your reputation, and your ability to deliver. I think I'm gonna put this part on loop. I'll edit it. Well, think about this, right? Like, they come to us because we are, have a proven track record exactly. delivering large-scale projects. Exactly. How did we get there? Because we have the resources to do it. How do we have the resources to do it? Because we charge enough. Or we have the right culture. I, I want to get away a little bit from the charging enough because, you know, I understand that because even for us, as we're building our reputation, you know, you, you have to have some flexibility in there. Right? Like, let's be honest, price modification does play a role in building your reputation, okay? You know, like, shout out to Binion, I can't charge the same amount as Binion, they're fucking masters. Shout out to D-Box, I, I can't deliver giant fucking campaigns, right? You know, like, there's different, we're in a different league, right? So we're trying to get up to those leagues and we understand that, but we're not going to be like, you know, D-Box is charging, you know, six to eight thousand US a piece, and we're going to come in at a thousand US a piece just to get the business. This is stupid. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot, and even if they give you the job, you're going to fuck it up so badly because you don't have the proper resources to do it, your client's never going to call you again. Just think about that, right? Let's say on the off chance that you get the job, how the fuck are you going to do it? Yeah, bottom line. It's not a charity. you got to make money. Yeah. I think that's, that's the thing, right? It's that... Um, even when you go out to the community and you tell them these things, you know, they don't act on it. Like they, like, like you said, they, they think that you're, you know, when we started Caviar, you know, um, and I've been very transparent about this, the guys on the West Coast in Vancouver, you know, they saw us coming, the, the Toronto guys coming to Vancouver. So basically, on two, for people that don't know Canada, you know, Tor Toronto is in the center of the country and it's the sort of financial capital. Vancouver is a very well-to-do city on the West Coast. It's about a five to six hour plane ride apart. So when we first started doing work in Vancouver, you know, we got a lot of headway because we had a really good reputation for um, delivering work. And then, you know, when I started Caviar, they're like, is this another ploy to take more of our work away? And I said, guys, professional associations are not about BD. They're about TD, right? It's not about business development. It's about training and development. You have to just, you know, it's like this. It's like the NBA, okay? Do you, you're, in, you're in Israel. Do you watch the NBA? I'm a sneaker head, so. <laughs> you're a sneaker head, okay? So, look, I believe competition is healthy. Look at what Magic Johnson looked like. Look what LeBron looks like, okay? Competition is good. It makes the players better, it makes the game better, it makes everything better, okay? So on the court of rendering, we need to be competitive and we need to fight it to the, to the death. 
but as an industry, we're the league, right? And as the owners of operations in the industry, we're the owners of the teams, right? So the owners of the teams, they're not fighting against each other, right? It's not like the owners um, want other teams to fail, right? Because the, the health, like, you know, the reason why they have a salary cap, right? Which in our case would be a fee minimum, if you would think about it, right? And so that the other teams can thrive and that the product gets better and there's more demand for the product. I love the analogy. Right? So yes, we have to compete as, as artists. But what should we be competing on? It shouldn't be competing on fees. It should be competing on skills and talent yeah. and our art. Right? I always say this. If, if someone can take away my client, good for them. It means I've done something wrong. And my reaction to that is not to lower my price. It's not to go and sabotage my, my competitor. It's to improve my team. It means that I'm not fulfilling something that my client needs. That's why my client left. It's not because um, you know, my, my competitor did something sneaky or my competitor did something nefarious. It's because I did something or didn't do something, quite frankly. This is a very mature way to look at this. Do, do you feel like you changed into this person like because of looking at the industry? And I'm asking you this because I look at it from the outside. I don't work in production anymore. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of people that come up to me asking me these questions. I notice a lot of immaturity. And then I see those who are thriving and are running very cool businesses. When I do have a chance to talk to them, I can really understand that, you know, emotionally, they look at this whole thing in a much different way, closer to the way you're describing it. So do you think you had to go through an emotional change in order to see things like this? How did that happen? Do you think you came to it on your own? Uh, I mean, you know, I would say that, you know, it's the result of a lot of life circumstances, you know, so things that just happen, you know, that, that, you know, I believe life is, you know, half skill and half luck. And by luck, I mean, you know, it's just the things that, that happen to you over the course of life. I don't mean that you're lucky. I mean that, you know, things happen. Uh, I've come pretty close to having to shut down the, the studio three times in the last five years. Um, I've also had um, a lot of success along the way as well. And the culmination of all those events um, has built up a studio. And, you know, I think, I think the main difference is that I don't spend time in production. And my job is to keep, like I said earlier, I, I have to keep people in jobs. I have to keep them paid. I have to keep them, you know, keep a roof over their head, really. And when it comes to that, that really changes your perspective, right? Because like the, the people that sort of, you know, undercut and, and, you know, fight tooth and nail to win market share, they don't realize that that's a race to the bottom. Mm. The thing that funda fundamentally changed it for me was that, you know, here in Toronto, we've got a vibrant business industry, but there's been a couple studios that have had financial issues. I look around the world and I, I like you know I look at all the studios and you know a lot of them have disappeared in the last few years. Yeah. You know, mid-sized uh, studios. So what you have left is a field of really big studios, small studios, and freelancers. So we're you know medium going on to being big. Now here's the thing: as the owner of the business, this is a significant asset that I own. Okay. So in order for this asset to be valuable, it's not the business that matters. It's the industry that matters. Because even if you have a giant behemoth of a business, if there's no real, if, if the industry itself is not profitable and not attractive to other buyers, when I retire or decide to get out of it, who the fuck's going to buy the thing? So I've taken the view that in order for me to be able to successfully and profitably exit my business, 
one of the key elements is for the industry itself to be healthy. And we are a long way from that right now. We're a very long way from that right now. I think this like, is... You think about it, right? Like, th think about this for a second. If, um, if I fold it today, how many people out there would have the capacity and wherewithal to buy my operation today? Yeah. Yes. It would have to be like a, a big developer that decide to bring the process of like visualization in house and you know, they would take your business, but the probabilities are very low. I understand what you're saying and I, and I can tell you, this is one of the things that worries a lot of, uh, archivist business owners. And I've had this discussion with some artists because I talk in my, when I go and talk at conferences. I always talk about having an exit strategy, right? You start a business, you should be thinking about what's going to happen 20, 25 years down the road. And a lot of artists, they look at having an exit strategy as almost a way of like cheating the fact that they are artists. And as an artist, you cannot stop being an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I see oh. your eyes going around like <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying this man <laughs> you know I, I think I think the problem is that it's a byproduct of architectural education yes I'm totally a hundred percent with you on this you know the, the fundamental culture of architectural education because the majority of participants in this field are architects and the problem is that the culture of architecture schools for ever and a day now is that you basically work until the fucking deadline and you never stop until you know you have to hand it in you know when I was in architecture school we we'd sleep in the studio for like three four days if we slept at all I think that's really damaged the, um, the overall industry and I think the lack of focus on business in architecture school because um, unlike most fields, there is a greater percentage of um, sole proprietors and freelancers and, and you know small businesses in architecture, right? And uh, like even if you think about professional associations, like so here in Ontario, we have the Ontario Association of, Ar Association of Architects. And they set out a rate card and they set out ground rules for competitions. And they, but these people, like they, they constantly think about, you know, where's my next dollar gonna come from? To the point where they throw all of that away and constantly undercut each other. You know, how, like how the fuck are you supposed to make it? Like, it's stupid. And, but that's just the architecture mentality. It's, it's unfortunate. Like, I mean, ultimately, like, I mean, you know, unless you've made it during your career, you know, most rendering studios, you know, if you'd had to, if you had to value them as businesses, it'd be fixtures, hardware, cash in the bank, and maybe, if you're lucky, goodwill. It's nothing. Your book of clients is worth nothing because there's nothing to stop them from leaving if you leave. Yes. I'm 100% so like, with you D -box on this. And, that's why like, I'm watching D-Box and I'm so envious, right? Because you know, they're making associate partners here and there. They've got you know, new partners and all that kind of stuff. Like That's smart. Hayes Davidson, same thing. Now, these guys have been around longer than, than most and they've matured to a point. But you know, if you're a studio, um, you, know, you have to be thinking about succession planning from early on. Norm, let me ask you about the idea of purpose. Um, you know, this is a little bit of an abstraction. Do you have purpose? Do you consider yourself having a purpose? Yeah, something that uh, I think is very important to uh, both individuals and companies. I think, um, especially for companies, not having a purpose fucks you. It really does because it doesn't give your team something to aim for and I'm going to be the first to admit I'm terrible at, at 
um, articulating our purpose. I really am. I'm still working on it. So, like, if, if you're out there and, you know, you're like, well, I don't really know what my true purpose is, you know, you know rendering's not really my true purpose, don't feel bad. It's, it's not an easy topic. Um, pers personally, my purpose in life, as I see it, is to do cool shit with cool people in a cool environment. And my role in all that is to, you know, maintain the balance that allows us to stay cool. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's kind of you know my purpose in life, right? It's like I, I don't aspire to, um, I don't purposely aspire to greatness. You know, I think, you know, the thing that you're most focused on is always the thing that's going to bypass you, right? Because, you know, greatness or success or whatever you want to call it is the the culmination of a lot of little things that build up over the course of your life, and you know, you know the, you know that that old adage, you know. Uh, great is the enemy of good you know like um, I think if you are good at a lot of things you become great but if you're single-mindedly focused on being great yeah. you may or may not make it um, I don't know I heard today somebody saying I, I'm trying to remember who, who said that or where I read it that if you try to be great for yourself it's selfish if you try to be great for others, it, that that's what you're supposed to be 100%. doing. Hundred percent. And this is this is the thing, right? Like, if you spend, look, right? What's what's the law of energy? There's only so much energy in the world. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Right? All you're doing is transferring energy. So here's your choice in life. You can be focused on spending your energy, looking for ways to defeat your competitors. Or you could spend your energy trying to build the people around you. As you build the people around you, their energy will bounce back to you. You know, if you drain the energy out of the people around you, there's only so much energy those people have. Once you drain it all, it's gone. What you need is to create a loop where you're bouncing energy off each other, giving it back and forth sharing the energy and, and building it right so like yeah there's only so much energy but you're not going to be able to yeah you know, what you can do is you can attract more people you know attract more people to your cause attract more people to, to your to your tribe so that the energy in your tribe grows and grows and grows 100 yeah. percent norm okay we mentioned the word success what does success look to look like to you um, success is constant growth. I think that's the thing. Like, you know, I thought about, you know, what does it look like when I retire? What does it look like, you know, when I, you know, or if I, if, if for whatever reason I had to stop doing this one day? I think I'll always be successful so long as I'm always growing. You know, life has a lot of twists and turns, but, you know, so long as you're growing, you're always going to be headed somewhere. That's the bottom line. I don't, you know, our studio, uh, you know, we our, our charter statement or our, our mission statement is always better. Always better than what we did today. Better than what our competitors did, but also better than what we did ourselves. Right. So it's not it's not a it's not a competitive statement. Right. It's a statement about constant reflection, revision, and improvement. And yeah, that's what I would consider success is that, you know, the ability to continue to grow and grow and grow, be it personally, be it professionally. Um, yeah, that's what I look forward to in life. I love it. Norm, do you believe me if I tell you that we've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes already? Really? <laughs> that would explain all the, uh, that would explain all the uh, texts I'm getting asking me where the fuck I am. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, I want to thank you for the time that you took to do this interview. I'm really humbled by the fact that you decided to be on the show. As I said, you know, I'm a very big fan of your work. Um, when I started to dig through your career, I was like, oh, damn, you know, this is going to be a very interesting conversation.
<laughs> and then when we started to talk, I was like blown away from the fact that, you know, you really do see the things the way they should be seen from anybody who's trying to, you know, make their own business or they're trying to uh, build something, to create something. And I really hope that this interview is going to be seen by a lot of people because honestly, I think that there is a lot of value in it. And uh, I don't know, I had a lot of fun doing it and I hope that you're going to like it also when you're gonna watch it. So I wanna say two things, thank you. Thank you for having me, you know. We, we don't think of ourselves as, you know, like a world famous studio or anything like that. Like, I mean, we like we, we sort of almost purposely fly under the radar. So it was, you know, it was kind of shocking to get an invite from you. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to say thank you to you um, and, and, and uh, your partner for, for put, A, putting on D2, B, but also taking the time to build community and, and share these stories. I think... There's not nearly enough of it. I think that um, things like the, this podcast, things like D2, um, you know, I know you mentioned Jeff Model earlier. Great guy. I've never met him, but you know, I respect what he does. But I think the difference between what he does and what you do, and again, no side against him, but really what you do is so much different is because you're bringing personal stories together. And, and, you know, we can talk about all the tutorials, all the technical stuff, share all the work we want. You know, it's like pictures of kids, okay. right? I've got two kids. I've got a two and a four-year-old. Everyone posts fucking pictures of their smiling kids. Pose nicely, you know, having a great time. The true story is that they're taking shits on the carpet, they're pissing the bed, and they're throwing up. And I think that, you know, what your... Um, your, your venue here allows people to do is to see, hear, and, and relate to the fact that, you know, especially in the era of social media and reputation management, how the sausage gets made is far messier than the end product. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I hope people take away is that, you know, don't look at all these studios like, I, I don't know Debox, I don't know Binion, and I don't know, you know, Neoscape and all these guys. But I can almost hazard to guess that it's not nearly as clean as their images in terms of the way they produce it. I'm sure there's lots of heartache. I'm sure there's lots of, you know, gnashing of teeth. I'm sure there's lots of fights and, and disagreements in the background. And people should take comfort in knowing it's not just them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're totally right. You're totally right. Um, I think, I think you know, you doing this putting out all this uh, stuff for others to hear, it's going to enable people to finally see what reality really looks like, you know? I hope so. I really do hope so. Because, the, that, like, you know, um, so one of the great tools I have in my life, and feel free to cut me off because I know this is going along, but I, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, one of the great things that happened to me in life was that I got invited to join um, a peer group. You know, so it's this group, I think in Europe it's called Vistage, V-I-S-T-A-G-E. Never heard of it. Uh, okay, so it's called Vistage. There's other organizations out there like um, uh, uh, Young Entrepreneurs or like uh, YPO, which is Young Presidents Organization, all this kind of stuff, right? But, you know, it's it's about having other people in similar positions of as myself that come from a very diverse background. So, you know, some guys own a construction company, some guys own an architecture company, some guys own a, a law firm. We get together once a month and, you know, we, we all share our sort of um, problems. And you quickly come to realize that everyone has exactly the same problems. And it's not just you. And when, when you, and that, that's the reason why, like, you know, before I started this interview, my, I'm at a convention center with my team, we're setting up a display for, for, a, for a client. He said to me, please don't say anything stupid. Please don't say anything embarrassing, you know. But but the truth is, is that you know, ultimately by being utterly and completely transparent, you give other people a chance to understand that they're not alone and that they can also overcome their issues. And that, to me, will help the, to, in my mind, will help the industry be a better place 
and make us all more successful. Yes, absolutely. And also, like, you know, um, a lot of people think that the reason why, you know, D-Box or uh, Neoscape, they get to charge more money is because they are on a different level of smart. When actually the reality is that, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to say that they're stupid or anything, but we're all oh, the I'm same. We're all the I'm same. You, you, but you know what I mean? That we're all the same. Like, <laughs> nobody's smarter than others, you know? No one's smart. Like, there are some people that are smarter on a technical level, but, I mean, as a whole... As a whole, we're exactly, all right? You know, like, the, 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 the processes and everything, when people come together, it's... You know, we're still dealing with the fact that we're all humans and humans make mistakes, as you said in the very yeah. beginning, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, I hope your your viewers and your listeners get something out of this. And, uh, you know, I, I hope I can just sort of help. I guarantee you they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to, you have to let me know how many, uh, how many plays or how many, how many spins this thing gets. Oh, you, be you'll see it. Because you know, like you know, like that, um, that uh, uh, series of articles I wrote for uh, Ronin back like, like three or four years ago. Okay, I haven't seen them, but I'll, I'll. Uh... Okay, so I wrote, I wrote a series of articles for Ronin like ages ago, and I was like, I don't think anyone will ever see this, or like a lot of people, I, you know. We still get people referencing that article to today, so you know, like it's 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 kind of interesting, right? Like the impact that that had, and that's why, like, when I agreed to do this, I was like, "Fuck it, you know what? I'm gonna do the same thing. Just like full on, like open the kimono and just like show it all and talk about it all." So because <laughs> I mean, like, let's be honest, right? Like, I mean, it's important. It's really important. It's part of the maturation of the industry, and yeah, that's all. Norm, will I get to see you in Vienna at the D2? You know, um, I would love to come to Vienna. It's always been on my list. I've sent team members before, and it's kind of that thing, right? It's like the boss always gets to go last. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of course. Like, I, I, I always get the shit end of the stick, basically. You know, like, the team gets the better computers, the team gets the better everything, and I kind of get the shit end of the <laughs> stick. So I'm, I'm hoping that I do get to come to uh, D2. Actually, you know, so, someone reached out to me last year. Um, Autodesk actually reached out to me last year and was considering having me as a speaker at D2 because uh, they sponsored you, right? Yes, so basically... But it, was, it looked, sounded like it was just too expensive to get me over there. So Autodesk, they, we work together because, you know, we yeah. make a selection of the speakers and we were the ones that said, okay, if this is the option, we would like to have this guy. Yeah. And I think that, you know, they've done their calculations and they were like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> Well, yeah, because, I mean, you have a wealth of speakers over in Europe already, right? So, I mean, that's a little more sensible. Like, I mean, you know, so, but yeah, I, I, I you know, I was flattered to even be considered. So, thank you. You're so humble, seriously. Like, uh, honestly, you know, knowing what you have done, you're a, you're an incredible person. And I, I'm so happy and so honored that you decided to, to do this interview with us. Norm, welcome and thank you. I'm not gonna steal any more of your time. Thanks a lot <laughs> for doing this. I'm going to stop the You're recording. Welcome. Don't go anywhere. I'll put all the links yeah. to your company, to your social media. If people want to find you, where is best to go? Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Uh, probably Instagram. So it's uh, at uh, Norm and the Gang. So I'm sure you'll put up a little fucking like. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, and by the way, I love the name. Like, I I love how you guys do your social media. I think this is really like an example of how social media should be done. Like the communication with the with the outside well, world. I mean, you know, we we work hard on it, and that's down to uh, the genius that is Kim Bell Mayo in our office. Shout out to Kim. Um, you know, it's not like I do all this shit, right? Like, you know. I gotta make sure that you know the people that deserve the deserve the credit get the credit. So shout out to Kim; she does a great job. I don't I don't think we'd be where we are today without her. Kim, she's amazing. She does an incredible job. <laughs> Trust me. I I I also consult people on the social media aspect, yeah. and I ref reference the work that you guys do very often. So that's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Norm, don't go anywhere. I'm stopping the recording. Thanks a lot for yeah. doing this. Let me say goodbye to you in person once this is done. Thanks a lot again. Okay, sure. Bye.